Yeah, yeah. Sir, it is live now. So, Agatha, can you check from the YouTube? Yeah, I, I, I couldn't reach. But I did not get any code today. Is already live? Yeah, you don't get because if you do from the same system, you don't get same code. Same system. It is already live. Oh, okay, okay, okay. okay yeah, we can start, live. sir. Baskarao, sir. Namaskar, sir. Sir, good afternoon, Baskarao, sir. Good afternoon, Baskar sir. Okay, Baskar. Sir, we can start, right? right. Yeah. So, uh, Sai, sir, we are going to start. Yes, we are approaching to two hundred mark. Uh, very, very good afternoon to all uh, for joining the third lecture of uh, Sama SRMIST. Open classroom online lecture series in atmospheric and uh, climate sciences. So we are in uh, third lecture now out of 16 lectures. So without any delay, we will start the session. Now I request uh, Professor Someshwar Das, Secretary Sama, to welcome the uh, panelists as well as the participants. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Lakshmi Kumar. ABM. Professor Ajit Tyagi Saab, President of SAMA. Uh, Professor S.K. Das, uh, uh, former chairman of the Center for Atmospheric Sciences at Indian Institute of Technology, Delhi. Professor Deepak Karyal, chairman of the Central Department of Hydrology and Meteorology, Tribun University, Karwandu, Nepal. Uh, he is also the member of the advisory panel of the lecture series. Members of the organizing committee, uh, Professor Bhaskara, he is the member of the advisory panel of the uh, lecture series. Uh, distinguished participants, ladies and gentlemen, we welcome you on behalf of the South Asian Meteorological Association and the SRM Institute of Science and Technology, Chennai, India. As you know, this is the third lecture on research and career opportunities in atmospheric Atmospheric Weather and Climate Sciences. This is a very important topic for the beginners, uh, young scientists and students. The entire lecture series is designed for capacity building of people in the field of atmospheric weather and climate sciences by SAMA and SRM IST. We have a distinguished panel of very senior professors and scientists from reputed institutions of this region who are experts in the fields they will deliver lectures on fundamentals of the subject. The lecture series is targeted to postgraduate students and professionals of non-meteorological background who are interested in learning the subject of weather and climate sciences, research and operations. It consists of four orientation lectures, as you know, and 12 lectures on atmospheric physics. The first lecture was delivered by Professor Yushi Bhante of Indian Institute of Technology, Bhubaneswar, on fundamentals of weather and climate sciences. Uh, on 7th of January, the second lecture was on uh, uh, weather and climate services uh, delivered by Dr. Mahapatra, the Director General of Meteorology of India, Meteorological Department on 14th of January. And this lecture, Sri, will continue for four months, as you know. Certificates will be given to the participants who have registered for the course and will complete the entire course with at least 75% attendance and successful performance uh, in an evaluation test at the end of the course. The lectures are live streamed on the YouTube channel of Summer as you know. They will, they will be available afterwards on the YouTube for those who could not attend the, le the course on, on live. We shall try to have more interactions between the speakers and the participants in this lecture series. Please write your questions in the chat box our moderators will pick up the questions at the end of the lecture and they will be answered by the speaker. So enjoy the lectures and we wish you all the best. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Someshwar Das. So now I request uh, Professor Ajit Tyagi, uh, President of South Asian Metal Association, to talk about the relevance of the uh, today's topic. So over to you, sir. Thank you, Lakshmi, and it's a great pleasure to welcome Professor S.K. Dash, uh, Professor Deepak Aryal, and Professor Bhaskar Rao, uh, three great uh, figures in meteorology in South Asia, and also 
professor somesh members of the gct council distinguished other members of the sama and the participants i join uh, somesh to welcome all of you he has given background of our lecture series uh, which have been if you receiving a very good response and we are reaching out to maximum number of participants those both online offline youtube uh, in 41 countries more than 1400 students so success of this lies uh, by the eminent speakers who have created so much of interest among the participants for this particular lecture which is of highly relevant because these days uh, mythology is not confined to the mythologists the hardcore physicists or things like that it has evolved into a multidisciplinary field uh, from atmospheric physics to extending right of the to the engineering branches uh, remote sensing object instrumentation computer science atmospheric chemistry and also to the users which has become a multidisciplinary science and also the users also are now are you see is covering 30 economic sectors the applications of weather and climate science and climate change is 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 putting great demand for the people who are trained in the climate sciences so this is a vast scope both for research developing skills and employability in years to come and uh, we would like our young researchers and the students to know these opportunities and there won't have been a, a most suited person or better suited person than professor sk dash because of his academic background at iit delhi where he was chairman of the center of atmospheric sciences he is the past president of indian med society so he knows the its application in societal interface and also now he is executive council member of international federation of meds uh, societies where they are working to promote mythology especially in africa they have been made a significant progress there and we are happy that we are par partnering with the ifms and also with the non aligned movement which has enabled us to reach to so many countries and so many participants so uh, i think this platform is doing its job uh, to meet uh, the Uh, the demands which is emerging in, in this sector of atmospheric and climate sciences and trying to put uh, make a platform where the students and young researchers can interact with senior people both uh, in, in the academic research and the operational uh, streams of the meteorology and atmospheric sciences and benefit so with these opening remarks i once again thank uh, Professor S K Desh to have agreed to deliver this talk, and also to Professor Deepak Arial, who is now in Bangladesh on short notice. He has we he has agreed to give his uh, views on on this particular lecture and in general on any other things which would like us to take up. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Tagish Tagi sir, um, for giving us the relevance of this present uh, in today's lecture. So now I request Professor Deepak Karial, uh, Tribhuvan University, Nepal, to give his remarks on the uh, today's topic: research and the career opportunities and in atmospheric and climate sciences. So over to you, sir. Ah, uh, thank you, thank you, ah, uh, thank you for providing this opportunity to talk at the beginning of this lecture series number three. I just uh, quickly check the lecture series starting from one to maybe up to twelve. Uh, it is divided into one to four and up from five to another uh, five, six, seven, eight. And uh, we should request to our very, very early career uh, researchers, like students, to join. We have to encourage to join them starting from five. One to four is, I think, somehow is beneficial for the early careers. Those who are already involved in uh, meteorological processes, the, those uh, who are known about a uh, uh, little bit about uh, the atmospheric process. But from five, all undergraduate and graduate students uh, should join this, and we, those people who are working in the academic area. they should encourage their students to join 
especially from five. Four is also very important, but uh, we do not uh, forget to mention them to join uh, starting from five. In my capacity, I will do my best to involve more than more and more students from uh, next session. And uh, finally, because I am in a rust and I am in a very very crowded area at the moment. Finally, what I would like to say is that uh, this is already 200 plus uh, people, 250, more than 250 people are joining. I hope after four, maybe it will be around more than 300, 300 plus, because the fundamental things are going to uh, going to be teach from uh, lecture series number five. Uh, with this, I would like to thank our Professor Taggy and Professor Sumes and all the organizers. Uh, and next to you, yes, this mic is over. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor uh, Deepak. Uh, now uh, it's time for lecture. So before uh, going for uh, lecture, so I request uh, Dr. Rohini uh, to introduce the today's speaker. Rohini, I'm sharing the screen. Okay. Yeah. Uh, is it okay? Uh, still okay, yeah. So good, good afternoon all. I take great pleasure in introducing our today's speaker, Professor S.K. Dash. Uh, he is Professor Dash is currently a professor at Center for Atmospheric Sciences, Indian Institute of Technology, Delhi. He has done his education in PhD physics from PRL, that is Physical Research Laboratory, Ahmedabad. He has about 40 years of teaching and research experience. He's involved in popularization of weather and climate science, as part of which he also writes science articles. He has been involved with a program named PROBE, initiated and funded by DST. And the main objective of this program was to educate school children about the weather and climate through actively participating in terms of regular measurements of weather parameters in day-to-day -day variations. He has received many academic honors and awards, some of which I would like to mention. Professor A.D. Wedmaker Award, Indian Meteorological Society for Best Published Paper. He also was a senior associate, Climatology and Metrology, ICTP Trieste, uh, Italy. He was an associate fellow, Royal Meteorological Society, UK. He is a president, Indian, Indian Society for Earth, Planetary and Environment Sciences. He's a member of different societies and academics. So he's a member of National Academy of Sciences. He's also a member of uh, American Meteorological Society USA. He's a member of EU India Grid Project Advisory Board. He's a member of National uh, Ex Executive Council Indian Meteorological Society, member of Editor Board Bayou Mandal, uh, which is the Bulletin of Indian Meteorological Society. He has also received award PPSC where he was a speaker at the Theoretical Physics Seminar Circuit Program, which is part of DST. His main research interests are interannual variability of Indian summer monsoon, climate modeling, and climate change studies, high performance computing in environmental sciences. He is the author of about more than 100 research papers published in field reviewed national and international journals. He has also authored a book as well as edited two books. He has developed and taught different courses in atmospheric sciences to graduate, postgraduate, and PhD students. So he has a vast experience of interaction uh, with students as well as with different societies. So I welcome you, sir. And his today's lecture is on research and career opportunities in this field. Uh, thank you, Dr. Rohini. Now I request uh, Professor Dash uh, uh, to proceed for his uh, presentation. So over to you, sir. You are able to share, sir. Is it is it visible now? Yes, perfect. Okay. <clears throat> Hello, everybody. First of all, I would like to thank uh, Sama, uh, specifically specifically uh, Dr. Tyagi and uh, Professor Mushir Das for inviting me to this uh, distinguished uh, lecture series. I also congratulate Sama for uh, starting this uh, series, lecture series. 
which are very much required for the uh, metrology community, weather and climate community. Today, I will uh, talk about this. Uh, I also thank uh, Rohini Bhawar for uh, talking nicely about me. <laughs> Currently, actually, I am a visiting scientist uh, in a center for excellence in climate modeling night daily after superannuating from this institute. And uh, I would like to mention here that uh, Professor Bhaskarao and myself, we have started a foundation, charity organization, that is Foundation for Education and Research in Climate Change. And uh, that is for the education purpose, education and research. Uh, gradually, we'll have our website, uh, and the students uh, will come to know about that. We have started funding one student from Ines of Science. And I am also chair of the IFS committee, where uh, I undertake a lot of activities in the education and training because it's a very important topic. So I wanted to integrate these uh, three aspects, education, research, and uh, employment opportunities together in the, the as mentioned in the title, uh, in our field, that is weather and climate is growing and growing. I am, I, I am unable to go to the, Next slide. Yeah. So today's discussion points are, uh, just I will briefly introduce the education and research organizations, what are the different types and the weather and climate. Then I will talk about this uh, progress made in weather and climate prediction uh, through collaboration of uh, institutions and scientists and uh, professors uh, through infrastructure development. Then I will come for the uh, need of climate education at different levels, because higher level education is not adequate. Then uh, I will try to show how the employment opportunities are very bright in this field. Then I will suggest uh, some points for the societies like SAMA, IFMS SAMA, like that. You see, there are uh, basically two types of educational institutions who are uh, dedicated to education and research and both. It's only education, research, and both. And also some institute our degrees and diplomas, some don't. But in addition to this, there are also organizations like uh, SAMA, let us say, and uh, meteorological societies and scientific societies in different fields, which are created for the creation of awareness of scientific issues. And they also spread education. So one cannot underestimate these organizations. They have a very, very important role. Weather and climate especially is multidimensional. We know it's multidisciplinary. It is uh, including physics, chemistry, mathematics, biology, all these fundamental sciences, computer science also. Uh, one who has uh, sufficient knowledge about these topics, fundamental topics can easily understand what is weather and what is climate and how uh, physical processes happen. And uh, on top of that, weather and climate Events affect all dimensions of the society, agriculture, human health, water availability, ecosystem, biodiversity. And today it is felt that, I'll go through our slides and show you that it is very important to have PPA collaboration. That is public, private, and academia. Then only substantial progress can be made. In this slide, you can see that all are intermingled. All these things uh, on the right hand side, that is the uh, climate modeling and atmospheric processes, ocean, terrestrial carbon cycle. These are all the fundamental things uh, or the core subjects of weather and climate. 
but in other part, left hand side, you will see impact, adaptation, and vulnerability. That is agriculture, forestry, economy, energy, human health, biosphere, sea level rise, global change, all these things are together. So this is all, it's a very, very broad subject. You cannot really distinguish uh, metallurgy as such from all these aspects, whether climate and society are all together. That is why we have the important role to play. And uh, solution to climate change is not simple. It is uh, known that the globe is warming. Earlier, people were not believing, but today there is no doubt. There are substantial proof that the atmosphere is warming up and there are a lot of changes. And this is a global problem because of the emissions greenhouse gases, carbon dioxide, methane, nitrous oxide, like that. And the only solution, the only solution is to reduce the emission of greenhouse gases because greenhouse gases, although they are required to keep us in a comfortable position, we have really released a lot more which are not necessary through industrialization. And unless we reduce that, there is no other best solution. But it is very easy to say like that, but because the emission is linked to the industrial revolution, we are responsible and industries have given up, make, make our life comfortable and so-called progress we are having. And uh, industry is connected to the growth, growth is connected to the economy, because economy is the backbone of any country. Hence, it is not that easy to reduce the greenhouse gases and it is connected to the geopolitics. That is the whole problem. Although scientifically it is well understood and the remedy we know, it is not that easy. We cannot go back to the stone age and stop all the growth and industrial revolution what has happened. But we have to have sustainable development, sustainable growth that we have to learn through science and technology. So growth of weather and climate science, it is, it is metrology, but today you can tell that it is uh, weather and climate science. There are four, uh, four pillars, you can say. Sophisticated earth observing systems giving more data, improve understanding of the physical processes to research by eminent scientists, understanding the earth atmosphere system. And third is the Emergence of the numerical weather prediction, weather forecasting models, and climate prediction models. That is the third most important. And the fourth is obviously the high power computing system. Earlier, we were not able to do uh, many ex uh, sensitive experiments to understand the physical process and give good forecast. Today, it is possible because we have faster and faster and uh, state of the art computing system available. These are the four different sides. To tell which is more important than the other is very, very difficult. But in all these four aspects, progress has been happening, and that is how we have come to the present stage. Modeling is the most important, as I told, uh, based on the observation, obviously. Unless there is observation, there cannot be modeling improvements. We get observation, we put into the model, have more observation, try to understand through sensitivity experiments. But it was not so by 19, around 1960, back about 60, 70 years back, it was not like that. We were just having very, very simple processes, process-based uh, models. We know that the physical processes are there, chemical processes are there, and also biological processes, that you cannot neglect the biological processes because ocean is involved, land vegetation is involved, space is involved, atmosphere is involved. So before 1960, there were only descriptive models. Through 60s, 80s, the development of mathematical models of the atmosphere alone. Then they came up, they could, uh, scientists could understand that atmosphere is forced by the ocean. So we have to also have a couple model, Earth atmosphere together were coupled and today we are not satisfied. We know that this is not enough. We have to also include other biological processes 
and uh, snow, ice, melting, all these processes have to be, bio-geochemical processes have to be included. So we are going to our system model. Our system model is today the main mantra. Without our system model, nothing can happen. And uh, not only that, we are not satisfied with global models alone because we want to reach the society, societal issues, impact studies, that is called the VIA study, that is vulnerable impact and adaptation studies. How vulnerable, what are the impacts, how we can adapt. Because as I told, we cannot really make the emissions zero. We can simply reduce. But even if you reduce today, it will take several years to come to that stage. We may not be possible to come back. And uh, that is why we want to have the regional models uh, intermingled with the general circulation models with the sole purpose of dynamical downscaling and statistical downscaling for understanding the water processes, food, energy, ecosystem, migration, coastal area. So when you talk of the opportunity, you can now think of yourself that anybody who is experienced and have some knowledge of weather and climate and atmosphere, our system, yes, avenues everywhere to these opportunities to work in different ways. Then comes this latest one, that is this Codex uh, uh, 14 scales, that is along with the CME 6 uh, Codex, that is 12 kilometer resolution over the land, one can get the parameters. Those are available through dynamic downscaling. And uh, today also, in addition to all these, we have the Copernicus data system, which gives you 12 kilometer features for impact study. What is important is impact study. I'm not saying that research is not important, but in addition to the research, unless the research benefits reach the people, the society, it has no meaning. Forecasting is the main objective of the science, and climate prediction is in the longer time scale, which has emerged now. And if you can have climate service, the service providing to the people because of the climate change and uh, giving the projections for the future, then only we are doing some great science. And that is the whole purpose. We are marching in that direction. You see this uh, CMIP-6, as you know, is the latest one. And uh, about 234 authors from 66 countries have worked to have this report, the IPCC report. And it clearly says that the research of so many scientists together clearly say that humans are unequivocally responsible for global warming. There is no if and but. Although there are some climate skeptics are there, but it is uh, well accepted that we are responsible for the global warming and hence the climate changes. And some climate systems are irreversible. Like uh, you can reduce the greenhouse gas, but uh, changing the land uh, use pattern, the forest the deforestation, all these things will take uh, uh, I don't know, it is actually irreversible and uh, how many uh, long time it will take, it's God knows, but it is irreversible process that is more dangerous than the greenhouse gases itself, the land change pattern. And uh, there is a silver lining at the end of the tunnel. There is some light available because although it is uh, it has come to a very, very serious stage. It is not uh, uh, time, uh, this is not too late, you can say. It is not too late to avoid the worst impact because we know that studies have shown 1.5 degree and 2 degree um, about those uh, increase in temperature, the, well, the significance of these two numbers. Two degrees will be disaster. And uh, something came out after studies that 1.5 will be manageable. We should not uh, go beyond. I'm not going to details, but we should see that we don't exceed 1.5. And uh, if we go to two degrees and more, which may be possible by the end of the 21st century, that will be really, really 
disaster for all of us. That is the climate emergency. And again, this uh, latest report, AR6, shows that these are the silent features, which uh, we have to take home the message that extreme heat will be more frequent and intense. There is no doubt. Droughts will be increasing in some regions, already started in Africa, Eastern Africa. Heavy rain, more frequent and intense in many cities in the world, including in many cities in India, it has started. Wildfires, you get the news throughout, not very much in the Asian countries, India at least, but uh, many in the UAS, Brazil, and several places, Australia, they are having more frequent. And ocean is the most important place, most important earth system in the earth atmosphere system is the ocean because that forcing. It is warming, not only warming, but it's acidifying and losing oxygen. Once it loses oxygen, there is uh, becomes very, very precarious because no life can sustain there. That is the whole issue. So these are the take home message that these things are going to come in future. Then only we'll find the scientific answer and try to get out of the system. So, Actions are needed at all levels because climate change encompasses all aspects of the society and everybody should be responsible to take appropriate steps. That is why international treaties are happening. That is why national climate missions are happening. Even in larger countries like India, every state has action plans. So that is at the political level, administrative level. Scientists are doing their bit. They to understand the critical science issues for better forecasting at all scales. Technocrats, their job is to invent clean energy sources, alternative sources of energy like solar, emphasis is given on solar energy, wind energy. And uh, students should understand the problem and try to try for out of the box solutions. Young mind, if they are trained from the beginning, if they are aware of this problem from the beginning, if they are aware of this climate science from the beginning of their career, which is not really happening today, who knows, they can find out some out-of-box solution for alternate source of energy, green energy. That is the best solution to stop the emission because without energy, you cannot uh, manage. Citizens, citizen science is coming up. That is, they collect data. And that is how they can contribute to this science. Science is not, it is not a ivory tower, research will happen and nobody can know what is happening. Now it is every newspaper is having some discussion about climate change and citizens can also contribute their own way. Then scientific societies like Indian Meteorological Society, American Medical Society and Royal Medical Society, these are the two most important societies who have been contributing Canadian Metallurgical Society also. And there is one international forum, a metallurgical society, where all these societies are member. And now that Sama has come up, it is definitely a great role to play. In fact, I envisage Sama as a regional metallurgical society. This association, it is also named association. I feel sometimes that Regional metallurgical societies like uh, European metallurgical society and now African metallurgical society has come up through the help of IFMS. They have much more role to play than anybody else. And general mass, how they can help? They can buy natural friendly practices. They can adapt, save energy, uh, become less uh, wasteful activities you should avoid. That is the role of the general mass. Now let us come to the other part of the lecture that is about the progress made uh, in the last 100 years in the NWP applications forecasting. Here actually from 1999, American Metallurgical Society has a very important role to play. They brought the communities, societies together and this uh, progress uh, almost the last 100 years if you look at is a very nice paper. This discusses and highlights the importance of 
society, metrical society. Divided these four eras, 1919 to 39, that is the age of maps, that time maps were utilized uh, and graphical methods were utilized for giving forecast. Then came the 39 to 56, the age of aviation. People came to know that only surface data is not enough. We should have more data at the higher level so that most clear. And then 56 to 85, the forecasting with uh, um, computer maps and graphics and NWP. So there are uh, maps prepared by the uh, computers, then graphics and numerical other prediction models. And you can say the modern era, that is after 85. And uh, here this analysis says uh, on topics on the four eras, four rather five eras, you can see, because future era, next 30 years is also there. Five eras and eight different aspects, like state of forecasting, observational use for forecasting, science understanding, influencing forecasting. One can read this, it's a very, very interesting document and how uh, the first year, 1999-39 stage, only governments were more responsible, then how the private uh, organizations came into being. And uh, next uh, 30 years, it is uh, expected that something called global weather enterprise will take charge of all activities where there will be uh, private, public, all will work together. That is the future. So these are the four issues. Similarly, in the next page, you find four different issues. And uh, here, there is something called media communications at the end. But there is something on the third column, you can see the uh, understanding part. That is how in the first era, uh, groundwork had been done by Richardson, Rusby, and Berknes, that is the scientists. Then how the next era, NWP development begins. Uh, mostly from the Sweden it started, then how rapid advance in NWP from equivalent barotropic to uh, primitive question models with limited physics started, then how global models took over, then how transition to our system prediction started. Next comes the future. Future is global non-hydrostatic convective scale NWP models, and uh, <clears throat> there will be inclusion of water cycle, energy budget, atmospheric flows, and what not, dispersion, complete urbanization. That means there will be models, global model, then regional models, then urban scale model, all mixed together. That is the future, use of artificial intelligence uh, and uh, several other aspects uh, in the future. Climate modeling, how we start develop, only few examples I will give because these are is two of repute, and one should at this stage you should know how these the institutes came up, which uh, uh, contributed a lot to the growth of this science. Princeton University is at the top, and you know Manove got the Nobel Prize for this type of uh, mathematical modeling, numerical modeling, and uh, Smagiromsky started that laboratory geophysical fluid dynamics laboratory GFDL. And uh, all the scientists, he brought together all the top level scientists. And uh, this has been written in the book by Manobe, Beyond Global Warming, How Numerical Models Reveals the Secrets of Climate Change. It's very interesting. I have not gone through, but I have read this summary part. And this is a fantastic institute which uh, uh, put the foundation of this uh, dynamical modeling uh, along with the physical packages at the uh, base level. Then ECMWF came up. We have, all of us know about ECMWF. We started in European, 35 European countries under the cost program. And uh, uh, it is both research and operational. Very difficult to really separate the research organization operational institute in weather and climate. This is the best example. And uh, both forecasting community has uh, uh, improved, uh, has got uh, enough uh, help from this uh, institute along with the progress in uh, science. Then they, they have the latest, they have started an open IFS project, which is easy to use uh, of the, for their forecasting model. 
for education and research in different universities. Another institute of reputation is the UCAR, which is formed under UCAR, that is the University Corporation of Atmospheric uh, Research. And they have different levels of modeling, different. Today they have the R system model, but uh, initially they started with very and well documented. All their models were so well documented. One scientist, uh, early career scientist person can, around, can read those and learn a lot. And latest is the community R system model. Uh, it is a couple developed, uh, it is a couple model developed by UCA and funded by NSF, uh, NASA, and DOE combined. And community R system model, that is the future because every student should get chance to uh, satisfy their intellectual uh, curiosity by doing sensitive experiment through the models. And that is possible only through community R system type of models, which is happening in uh, US. And you can do your own sensitive experiments and can also contribute to the development of the model. And uh, then the, it is also all over the world. Who doesn't know WRF? WRF is a model which has been developed through collaboration of different organizations and really benefited a lot of young scientists. They are, they are able to do so many sensitive experiments and uh, publish papers uh, to this. There are two versions, as you know. One is the advanced research version and another is the non-hydrostatic mesoscal model because you know that beyond a certain resolution, if you want to go for high resolution, hydrostatic uh, approximation will not work. So you have to go for non-hydrostatic model uh, for 10 kilometer, 15 kilometer. Uh, you have to go for this. That is why this model is widely used all over the world. These are the different uh, milestones one can say that through these organizations, we have got the R system model and the WRF for uh, our uh, research and forecasting. Now I'll go to a different aspect of the efforts of WMO, which as an international body, which is in charge, or you can say, which is responsible for maintaining the uh, protocol in observations and helping organizations to grow and the national uh, meteorological and hydrological services, all of them are under this uh, WMO guidance. They have, this is the future, that is open consultative platform. In uh, uh, 2021, 1st April 2021, this paper has come up, which is uh, for the future. That white paper has been prepared by 30 leading experts from research operations and education fields, analyzing different challenges and opportunities. And uh, National Meteorological and Hydrocar Services primarily give uh, uh, this sports uh, forecast. However, many others, it should be realized that in addition to the National Meteorological and Hydrological Services, uh, organizations like ECMWA, and today there are so many private uh, sector companies and academic institutions are also giving forecasting. So WMO wants to take all this together under one umbrella. And uh, in 20, uh, 2019, it launched the open consultative platform where uh, Next generation weather and climate uh, uh, community uh, is supposed to work together to this uh, platform. That is, you can see here that uh, stakeholders and customers have a very, very important role to play. They are feeding the operation, operation, operational organizations. They are also feeding the services sector, and they are also supposed to feed the research and development sector and all will work together, research, operation, services, and the stakeholders. These are the four different important sectors who should work together. That is the objective. And uh, these are the salient features of this OCP white paper. That is with appropriate investment in science and technology, the, and through better PPE, that is uh, private, uh, public uh, uh, engagement uh, together, 
the weather and climate centers will meet increasing stakeholder and uh, customer demands for tailor and seamless weather, that is weather to climate, weather forecasting to climate, and different time scales of forecasting. Then infrastructure for forecasting, that is observational and high performance ecosystems, science and technology driving advancement of numerical prediction, as, as I told, numerical R system and weather to climate prediction, high relation global ensemble models, NEWP, that is called NEWP, and uh, operational forecasting from global to local to urban. It is such a challenging world. Then cloud technology, verification and quality assurance, further automation of post processes system through artificial intelligence, then acquiring value through weather and climate services, that is the most important aspect, forecast for uh, bridging the uh, between high impact weather and climate services, education and training, that is also given importance to this uh, OCP white paper. Then comes finally the global weather enterprise. That is the ultimate thing as per WMO, that uh, for future, the roadmap of w, GWE, that is Global Weather uh, Enterprise Challenge, depend on the collaboration, strength, commitment, and excellence of the public, private, and academia sector. That is the most important thing for the larger forecasting community. Not only the national meteorological and hydrological services of the respective governments or the countries, but also the private sectors and educational institutions, societies also were trying to do IFMS, were trying to enter into this uh, global weather enterprise so that there will be much role to play because I know that capacity development, as I mentioned, capacity development cannot happen unless the metropolitan society are on the road. They have to help. There is for the future exciting things. There are two examples I would like to show. There are many examples, like private sectors are uh, giving forecasting for the wind strength over even certain bridges that through artificial intelligence, where there is strong, sometimes strong wind uh, uh, takes away the breeze altogether, blow, blown, blows away the breeze. And uh, through artificial intelligence, it is possible to give the right forecast to save the place. Uh, but here, the two important examples are concern-based adaptation model. I have not fully understood this, but they are very interesting. But here, this, the tools are commonly used to help the evaluators, researchers understand, monitor, and guide the complex processes implementing new and innovative practices. All together, I don't know how these things are happening, but they have already started in 1970s to 1980s, they started, but now they have updated in 2006. Today's CBM continues to be applied in the range of uh, organization and research setting. It will be directly, not only with the forecast, but that forecast also is applied uh, at the right place, on the right sector. And other is the private weather company, tomorrow.io, that started in 2016, is powered by weather intelligence software, this private company helps uh, teams prepare the business impact of weather, <laughs> business impact of weather by automatic decision making and enabling the adaptation at all scales. It helps countries, business, and uh, individuals to better manage the weather-related challenges. Very wonderful things are happening. And so, where do we stand, research-wise or teaching-wise? The era of NWP has taken the progress in weather and climate to a new height, and we have gained confidence amongst the people. Forecast is given to gain confidence, and we have done that to a large extent. Even in India also, we have experience. And the above has happened because of working together of scientists, operational agencies, and institutes of higher learning with uh, close collaboration amongst them. And scientific breakthrough has come due to theoretical advances in predictable fluid dynamics and numerical methods, subcritical processes, all these aspects. That, that means we have come to a very good state 
where we have to take uh, more steps in the right direction that is required. And what I have look, what we should do in future, increase that we know that there's increasing demand for climate products. Every sector, every person now wants the forecast for his uh, comfort or for his business or his touring or to save energy, different aspects. And they expect that the forecast should be given by the operational agencies or the private organizations. And there is optimism that with increasing understanding of the earth multiple ocean system developments in infrastructure based on science and technology, it will be possible to reasonably deliver for the good of the society. We can be better focused. And in the coming years, global non as I told, any WP model, that is numerical earth system and weather to climate prediction models will come up that can include nonlinear turbulent processes using sub-kilometer scale, sub-kilometer scale imagery model. That is uh, will so good. And in ensemble, it will represent the effects of large cities to ensure because pollution, the cities levels pollution also contributes to the global warming. And that also affects the dynamics. The urban setting also affects the dynamics of the atmosphere. So, any WP communication will rely heavily on mobile phone networks that is futuristic. It will happen definitely. Mobile phone network, because now, even now we have apps where you look at the weather prediction and know about the different parameters. Internet and social media tools will provide specific and adaptive services to different public users, such as crab, that is very mind boggling that how the car driver should go and how the cyclist will go. This type of details uh, are expected and may happen. And data mining will permit refining communication and social opening benefits of any WP. That is the catch one. But what is happening on the other side is that, although higher level education is given importance, a lot of research has been done, climate is not restricted to the forecasting alone. It is our system model and climate change and disasters. Climate change means there will be disaster, there will be energy deficit, there will be water non availability, all these things. So the education has to go to a different level. And present courses, it is felt that present courses are inadequate to, to tackle the climate. It has been done mostly in the natural science and later as engineering science. These colleges, this type of colleges and educational institutions have been teaching. But it is found in a 2021 study, about 110 students were taken for the experiment and 80% of them responded and they felt that these courses are not sufficient. They are not adequate for, to prepare the people or the students for the climate breakdown. Climate breakdown and climate emergency, climate disaster, this type of phases. Fresh climate breakdown cannot be tackled with the present level of education. That is the whole thing. And so there is a feeling that states must help schools to tackle the climate crisis beyond what is on the curriculum. That is why I don't say that higher education is the only thing, only uh, way to move ahead and do research. And you have to go to the school level because it is there will be migration, there will be poverty, there will be so many other things. They, it will affect the economy. So it is not only the science part, there is also societal part which has to be taken into consideration. So renewed understanding, renewed understanding of human life, intermingle with the environment in reshaping the education across all disciplines, arts, humanities, law, all these subjects have to be included. This is another study of UNESCO for the future, that is, it is called Education 2030. It shows that nearly 47% of the national curriculum framework of 100 countries reviewed have no reference to climate change. 100 countries reviewed and found that 47% of national curriculum framework in schools don't have any reference to climate change. They don't know what is climate. They don't know what is climate change. The countries include 
including climate change contained that those in the regions are vulnerable to the impacts of climate change as opposed to those that point uh, we can set aside. What it says that those which are releasing the greenhouse gas emission causing climate change, they have to be more educated in a sense. And uh, uh, another important finding is that nearly 95% of the teachers believe that it is important uh, or very important to teach about the severity of the climate change and effects, but fewer than 40% have confidence. They feel that it has to be done, but 40% have no confidence. About 40% of teachers are confident in teaching uh, different dimensions of the climate change, but only about one fifth can uh, really express that they will they know how to take action, sort of thing. So 40% of the teachers are not, uh, uh, you can say, very confident, but 40% of the people, they feel that, okay, can manage. And 55% of teachers reported that they have received training either pre-service or in-service on climate change. Why I'm talking of teachers? Because we can approach the students to teach us a lot. And uh, I will give example about two programs, one in Africa that is called Sand Watch Program, where there's a lot of damage to the sand uh, that over this the sea seashore. So the concept of sandwich was developed there, where students and teachers work together, and they it was a UNESCO program in 2005. And teachers saw firsthand many of the problems facing the coastal zone problem related to erosion, pollution, and development. And students interacted with them, took observations, they plotted these uh, curves, different types of curves for understanding. And that is how they both the communities uh, develop, uh, help each other. Teachers could know what is the uh, erosion, pollution coming up in the sand uh, area on the sea beach. And students also got interested because they are the hands-on uh, experience of what is happening there by observing data. And uh, with the help of their teachers and local communities, local communities also participated. They critically evaluate the problems and conflicts. They had discussions and uh, they learned about the beach environment with a strong field monitoring component. Sand watch tries makes uh, science like this is our like our eco clubs, for example. We have our eco clubs, and not only eco clubs in India also we started a program in 2005, which is called was Pro, which was very successful with 100 schools in. Uh, uh, Uttarakhand, we started, then it went to Odisha, Tamil Nadu, West Bengal, even in Delhi, where uh, other observatories were there, all the basic uh, equipments for uh, rainfall measurement, uh, wind measurement, temperature measurement were there in schools, and they were trained in IIT Delhi, the teachers, batches of teachers, they interacted with the students and took observations, not only that, those observations from different parts we put into the major scale model and found that these additional data from schools collected from schools had uh, they published in good journal uh, had impact up to 500 millibar in the atmosphere. So these are very successful programs. And here I would like to say that uh, uh, in Africa, East Africa, nine countries that is including the Horn of Africa countries, we are starting through IFMS a similar program like probe where other, other observatory will be there and specific courses will be formulated and uh, students will be involved so that from the very childhood they will have the awareness about what is happening to the climate. Not that they will immediately find some research tool and but it is, if it is in their mind then ultimately at some time they will think out of box way and give some solution. Some of them will be able to give solution. So we have, uh, because I'm giving this talk to this uh, platform, uh, SAMA platform on this platform, I thought that uh, I should mention about uh, what is the uh, role of this uh, responsibility of the scientific societies. Because also I was the president of IMS and involved with IFMS, uh, involved with many societies to IFMS. I feel that climate science education is required at all levels of the education system, not only higher education, 
more so in the schools rather. It is necessary to maintain equality between different levels of education and climate science. The undergraduate colleges should have and emphasis on higher education without proper feeding mechanism from below will not be effective. Only at a higher level, that will be too late to really think. We don't know anything for so many years, about 20 years or 30 years, we will not know anything. And suddenly we'll be exposed to the higher levels of research in uh, climate change that uh, may not be really effective. And uh, expecting national governments to introduce courses at schools and undergraduate levels is a tall order. I know that uh, at many levels there have been discussion that we should uh, uh, approach politically and have uh, courses at the school level uh, and undergraduate level. It will be very, very difficult because uh, uh, opening uh, different courses means additional burden for the students and it has to go through different processes. And it is not really that uh, kind of easy to that. But I otherwise, if you in other other way, if you think fundamental science courses are taught in schools, physics, chemistry, mathematics, all that taught. And uh, I feel that they have some. This is adequate enough. This is adequate rather adequate to understand the basics of weather and climate. It is adequate, but with some extra curricular activities or extra courses or not courses rather extra experience and understanding so that can be done by incorporating climate science uh, into the science courses itself by examples i can immediately tell a small example we know that science physics is all courses but no force gives example of they give the examples of electromagnetic waves gravity waves like that but they never talk about the pressure forces in the atmosphere, we have first taught about the pressure forces, that is, the, the higher level to lower level, and that has tremendous uh, uh, impact in the dynamics, uh, atmospheric dynamics begins from that. So similarly, I, in fact, we have done it for Royal Mail Society. They are, they are trying to know, they give the course and uh, request some experts to find out uh, what type of examples uh, in these physics courses can be given, climate examples, weather examples. Those things will not be extra burden. If the teachers are known about, they know about that, they can easily give example. And that is how we can integrate the climate science into the low level courses. And uh, that is why efforts should be made to incorporate climate into the science courses by citing examples. And scientific societies can address climate education through various means. They can take this uh, education to the public. And COVID has taught us that we can do online, as Sama is doing now, they're taking so many courses that is possible and it will help. Raising the general level of climate education will help making realizing its importance by the society policymakers. In due course, once this level of awareness comes at different levels of the society, obviously it will go to the policymakers and they will realize that climate science should be taught separately. But it, uh, it, it, we are not losing anything uh, if uh, we are uh, uh, going ahead in our pursuit of uh, 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 creating awareness amongst the students, teachers, public, and the citizens in general. That is more effective because it will be known to our mind. So scientific society need to be involved in climate change. Why? Usually meds related societies have members from metrological, hydrological societies, educational institutions, researchers, and NGOs, stakeholders. That is why that is number one. Number two is that members of med society include not only several existing employees, but also senior members, because senior members are lifelong. They are there, they don't have retired age in science societies. Those who are members, they are members, and they are more experienced, so they can contribute more. Many societies can contribute significantly to the centrality of open consultative platform, that is through collaboration, broadening, outreach programs, etc. So, where are the mainstream of WMO efforts, which is the future? Many societies can eventually contribute to the quality of training, also. We can focus on the regional languages, we can focus on gender issues, we can focus on regional weather 
uh, events so that it will be closer to the people. So one can go for this. Uh, I have just listed uh, four or five or six. Teachers training is my top priority. Public awareness for disaster management, exposure to numerical weather prediction, satellite data use, data collection uh, instruments, which will know about the instrument, processing and display systems. So under these different heads, one can start these preliminary courses for the teachers so that it will enable the students. Now comes the last one. Last is the opportunity. I don't have many slides on opportunity, career opportunities, because in a way I have wanted to uh, justify that uh, there will be more, uh, more jobs available. And that exactly has been done by US Bureau of Labor uh, Statistics. That atmospheric scientists can expect an employment growth of 8% by 2030. There will be growth of 8% in 2030. And it expects that about 1,000 job openings for atmospheric scientists each year from 2020 to 2030. For this decade, there will be at least 1,000 job openings. And uh, this is the statistics of US Bureau of Labor, which is very renowned. There is also another interesting I just came across a few days back. Parameshwar Ayer, that is Niti, the CEO of Niti Ayog, who is the CEO of Niti Ayog, he has gone through IMF study. It's a very long report. That is 221. IMF has uh, published a report. I tried to go through that, but uh, it's not really possible to uh, know the learn the details. So I am quoting him that he says that green and sustainable infrastructure has an economic multiplier of two to seven times larger than traditional infrastructure investment. That means if you go to the green energy, then you will get two to seven times larger uh, economic multiplier. That means you will get economic, economic will grow to seven times larger than the traditional. That means sustainable development was, is being discussed today is not in the uh, in the backward side. It is the advanced side. That means your your economy will also grow through that. So let us think that uh, this is an opportunity. The climate disaster or climate is, uh, is is an opportunity. And those who are knowledgeable about climate, weather, climate, and various aspects, you can't really talk of climate means only modeling. Then uh, you are you are you are thinking very narrowly. Job market means it has to be from different aspects, wherever there is a, a mention of weather and climate, the peripheral aspect, the application sites are much more than the actual fundamentals. Uh, just like the pharmacists uh, uh, develop, some researchers develop new virus and new medicine, but that is applications are at a different level. So it is not only the core sector which develops, the model, model, models, all the forecast. It is the other sector which is more important. Just like the doctors uh, prescribe to the patients and use the medicines and uh, bring out good to the society. Similarly, our products can be taken to the society through different uh, employment opportunities. And these are the highest paying jobs. I took it from this uh, Unity College record that environmental law is coming up solar energy consultants, environmental engineer, hydrologists, environmental manager, geologist, because you cannot say it's our system. So all these related science, uh, interdisciplinary, as I told, climate is interdisciplinary. Geologists, geologists have a major role to play. Environmental scientists, urban planner, which is a uh, few years back people, uh, didn't think about this, but today because of the extreme rainfall events and so many air pollution and urban issues are coming up, so urban planners are very much necessary and that is the job market. Geologists, you know, because of the virus and all these things, and uh, marine biologists, these are just to show some important uh, topics. And uh, <clears throat> so there are some suggestions uh, for the scientific society in general, general, that collaborating with all societies related to weather and climate with the objective of strengthening each other by adopting the best practices. 
society should uh, uh, work uh, in complement to each other that is they so they should uh, uh, find out the gap areas of one society and uh, put their efforts in that direction and also adopt the best practices in a, in one they, they should be together that is the point and the ppa mode of working because uh, public and private can uh, public academia can come easily to this public or to the private but to bring all these three together i think the societies metropolitan societies have a great role to play and focus on climate education in schools colleges and uh, society in general that is uh, uh, education part school education or can say lower level education tapping the unlimited energy of the seniors who can contribute to the society immensely broadening the scope of climate education and research for the good of the society you have to broaden the education and research aspect highlight the advantages of startups this is very very important for the uh, early career scientists and the youngsters that startups in many occasions give rise to innovations in technology and uh, startups are also enablers they enable the society to grow and uh, they are i think through startups one can uh, take advantage of the collateral benefits of climate change like different types of green energy different types of uh, equipment tools uh, things like that and uh, ultimately one has to the societies have to become so powerful that they can influence they can influence the uh, policy makers for uh, formulating uh, good policies for the good of the uh, region of concern it is regional although the climate change we know that climate change is global but effects are global so since uh, globally it is very difficult to make the emission suddenly zero and also we are not getting one aspect is going on that we should have clean energy and reduce the emission that is not going to stop it will come up with new start new companies have come up for different type of energy and reengineering the the uh, engineering aspect is also there geoengineering that is also coming how to capture the carbon i didn't tell about that how to capture the carbon and uh, th those uh, also be new jobs different types of different research <coughs> geoengineering is a separate branch of research even modeling is going on in geoengineering those that I, i could not touch on that so ultimately one has to uh, all the societies uh, have to have a voice of their own so that uh, uh, policy makers will listen to them i think uh, yeah thank you all that is my last one thank you all for your attention and i will be happy to uh, give some questions answer some questions if you have to go to the chat box or thank you very much sir chat box or uh, yes. uh, so thank you very much sir yeah uh, the moderators will take up the questions sir and they will okay thank you take thank your you. notice yeah thank you now i request uh, panel uh, i mean question and answers moderators professor pvs raju dr swagatna um, and dr rohini to yes, take up very, the questions yes shall i shall start uh, dr lakshmi yes sir yes sir please sir so very good, good evening so thank you sir for giving this uh, excellent uh, and uh, talk which is very informative uh, i am sure that this talk will uh, help the students and early careers researchers to identify the various uh, important areas of weather and climate uh, sciences and also they get the opportunities where we can get the opportunities so so just uh, that there are few questions uh, they had given the participants had given so one is uh, rajendra kumar panda so he is asking uh, earth will continue to warm and how the inter interconnected systems like space air and earth interact space air and earth how they can interact uh, in the warming atmosphere earth will continue to warm and how the interconnected system like space and uh, earth air and earth uh, obviously 
uh, there will be a lot of changes as in happening. But space part, I really don't uh, understand about the uh, so far the current uh, topic of global warming is concerned. Uh, space is because of the sun's uh, whatever solar changes occur because of that uh, rotation, etc., change in the inclination on a very, very long time scale. Or uh, there is also interaction of these uh, uh, particles coming into the earth. But if you talk of the global warming sense we are discussing, then earth, uh, earth air interaction will definitely change as has been changing. Because earth means what? You have to include the land surface processes, you have to include the uh, ocean. Uh, so uh, because of that, uh, this is contributing the land surface changes, uh, deforestation, etc., are contributing to the uh, greenhouse gas emission also in certain gases those practices are changing. So I don't know what the space has to uh, has a greater role to play or not, but definitely, but the, if the question uh, can be little broadened, then I may be answered in a yeah. better way. How they interact means uh, uh, earth and atmosphere interaction to change, like uh, earth, uh, there's warming, so ice will, uh, ice will melt, uh, sea level will rise, uh, things like that. There will be more acidity in the ocean. Uh, this type of changes will definitely happen. I don't know whether it satisfied this, uh, Dr. Ponda or not. Is he available live? No. Uh, Dr. Ponda. It's not possible to... Yeah, yeah they cannot talk. So. He, can, he can write probably. He yeah. can put in the chat, the question answer chat, whether it satisfied him. Or sir, you can you can type in chat box your email, sir, so that they will contact. Yeah, you can write the email to me. But uh, whatever I could understand from the question, how do they interact? Means the interaction will definitely change. There will be some changes in interaction because uh, warming of the air just above uh, will definitely affect the earth surface and the ocean. That is that 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 much I can answer. So, uh, sir, uh, my, my point is up to stratospheric that uh, it, that there is an interaction like stra stratospheric ozone and uh, uh, it will also modulate the climate, right? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, a temperature will not change only at the surface. Yes, yes. But there will be cooling also. There is yeah. a stratospheric cooling. Yeah. In the, with yeah. the height, with the height, the temperature. Right, right. Uh, when he mentioned the space, maybe it is like uh, about the sinosphere and uh, uh, this one. Maybe I think that the uh, earth climate is uh, uh, interacting with up to stratosphere level. No, no, the the, the, uh, the sphere, ionosphere also affects. There is interaction going on, mm. but how exactly? How much, yeah, yeah. That's what. My question how is, that is how the how the global the greenhouse gases. When you are talking of global warming, you are talking of the greenhouse gases. Yes, yes. So my point is that how the greenhouse greenhouse gases. Uh, will affect, uh, will interact, rather, will interact with the space uh, partic ionospheric particles. That uh, I can't really answer. I cannot think of. Okay. But uh, the temperature stratification will obviously change. As there is not a warming only at the surface, it is also cooling at the stratosphere level, isn't it? And as I told, ozone sphere, uh, the, those the type of actions will come up. Right, right. Yeah. Uh, Raghu, one minute. Uh, sir, can you uh, stop the sharing of the slide? Which slide? Uh, thank you for your attention. That slide is still shared. Uh, you can stop sharing your presentation, sir. Oh, I'll stop. Uh, ah, sorry. I'll... Yes, yes. Stop sharing. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah thank you. Thank you. Yeah, there is another question. Hariharan uh, Nitya. What uh, goats? Hariharan Nitya. Uh, she is asking, I think he's a maybe girl. So, uh, what course other than WRF does the IMD normally use for ensemble forecast? No, WRF is at the regional scale. Yes. Sir. But they have also GFS model and CFS model. So, uh, GFS is run in the ensemble mode and WRF uh, also. So, apart from these two models, this IMD is not running, but uh, NCMRWF is running the UK Met Office model. And they have their regional version that is also run in civil mode. 
But uh, in my knowledge, IMD is running WRF and GFS combinedly. But most important thing is that they are also consulting other models, uh, five to six important models, uh, uh, which output are available, like ECMWF. Uh, those are available to them. So what they run is only, as far as I know, WRF and IMD, the GFS. To but the IMD? Of, uh, uh, IATM, through help of IATM. And that assimilation is done by the NCMWF. But uh, they consult, in a way, they uh, take this output from other models which they are not running also. But they are doing ensemble prediction uh, for the India or India with different uh, regions, right, sir? Ensemble? Uh, they are doing ensemble prediction. IMD is, run, is doing an ensemble prediction. Yeah. There are two types. Can I, can I interest? Ensemble yes, prediction they are doing. Yes, they sir. Uh, ensemble one, prediction, definitely. Yeah. One is the real time ensemble prediction that is based upon the GFS, of course, and other is ah. the working model uh, <clears throat> ensemble prediction that is for the seasonal monthly scale that is done by. Probably, probably he wants to know what are the other models in the seasonal prediction. In the seasonal ensemble, probably uh, Nitya Haryaran wants to know what are the different models. I really don't remember uh, exactly yeah. what are the other models. So the standard you models are the ACMWF yeah, ACM is there, NSEP is there, and that NSEP model is there, and GFS is there, GMA model is there. So but five, six of them are used ah. for the seasonal prediction of the ensemble. That, that much I know, five, six models. Right. So although GFS is run in our country, GFS and WRF, other four, five or six models, they are utilizing their output in the ensemble mode. But I don't think they are running the models. Yes. None, none of our uh, issues are running those models in India. But they are utilized, their output is utilized in the ensemble mode. Yeah. Only the GFS and the UM, the United uh, Unified Model, yeah. those two are run by NCMWF and the IATM, that is IMD, on real time basis. Yeah. NCMWF uses the unified yeah. model. Correct. With their original version, they have also a regional model, global. You know that that model is having their own inbuilt regional model, so they are utilizing that. But that is not probably that is not utilized in the day-to-day uh, -day forecasts. Uh, they don't uh, even predict. They, they, they do display the real-time forecast based upon their UM regional on the website. Uh, yeah. And exactly. Besides, yeah. Besides that, they have also. Small, small tools for lightning prediction, power prediction, things like that. Uh, but they are all built in the based upon the WRF model or the regional UM. Yeah. So they are IMD definitely doing ensemble prediction. Yeah. There is no doubt about that. Yeah. Yeah. So there is another question, Paparo from uh... Center for Study of Science and Technology Policy in Bangalore. Uh, just he wanted to know that does climate change affect the transmission of coronavirus? <laughs> <laughs> you so see, it is a this question. Uh, yeah, it uh, is. One can say yes. One cannot. One can say no because climate change has also indirect impacts. So coronavirus origin, in a way, uh, because of the ecosystem change, the temperature, humidity, etc., are changing. So ecosystem is changing because of the change in the ecosystem. There are also several types of uh, virus coming about. So exactly corona, I don't know, but could be. But could could be. Just like uh, there are many species are extinct from the earth because of climate change, like golden frog and so many examples are there. Many plant species are also extinct because of the climate change, because the ecosystem is not favorable. That way it is connected to some extent, but uh, we cannot have the direct answer that coronavirus has come up because of the climate change. But in general, virus can come up of the change in the ecosystem, biodiversity, all are interconnected. That could be, but the coronavirus, I don't know. Okay. So, 
there is no uh, studies at least so far no study has shown that because of the change uh, in the climate system the coronavirus virus emerges other type of studies are coming up based on data or uh, direct experience but nobody has really so no study no paper has come up saying that coronavirus has uh, spread because of this there are some uh, like uh, there was debates few days back that uh, uh, whether it is airborne or not that also fizzled out in a different way because uh, airborne means one can interpret that it will uh, travel the virus will travel for a long distance but another way of saying airborne that uh, if 6 uh, feet uh, difference uh, gap is uh, mandated that means the coronavirus will move in the air up to 6 feet isn't it so whether you say it is airborne or not in classical sense it is not airborne because it doesn't go from here to 1 uh, mile 1 kilometer 5 kilometers 10 kilometers but it travels little distance that is why we are putting the mask so it is it is uh, it is in the air it can live in the air for some time for few minutes or whatever so spread depends on that there are some papers saying that because of the temperature rise the coronavirus will not be there but if you see across even in india and across the globe these papers have no meaning now because uh, uh, even in hot climate there is coronavirus in the cold climate there is climate in our country itself winter had coronavirus summer had coronavirus so how can you say that seasonal pattern or the weather parameters will affect the spread of coronavirus isn't it yes, so it is a very very difficult question but one can say that uh, there is some indirect connection there is there will be some indirect connection between the um, uh, climate parameters uh, and the covid uh, that is virus not direct Rohini and Swagata, you can take questions from YouTube also. If you have any questions? Yeah, there are some more questions in here. The link. Uh, Rohini, can you take over now? Dr. Rohini. Yes, yes, I'll do that. Thank you. So, sir, uh, there is a question from anonymous um, that our upper air observation is reduced from past ten years back. Then, how much we can rely on model? when we have less observation going inside <laughs> yeah this is correct uh, that uh, how much rely one doesn't know exactly but uh, they like uh, there is a study in this context i will say that there is a study during corona period because we were discussing corona during corona period there is some data gap uh, from the flights because flights uh, were stopped so there is a data gap and some people found uh, in ecmwf i think i had read somewhere that they found some impact uh, uh, for few days in the forecasting but it was not significant even in in our country also probably it was noted at certain stage that the data gap did not affect that much that much it didn't affect because upper air data are important but how many percentage of the data are not available and exact the quantitative study has to be undertaken to know but definitely it will affect the forecasting but another thing also should be taken into account that when you are having ensemble forecasts and uh, when you are having data from several other sources the uh, the loss in the accuracy may not be that great if you stop all the data all the observed data obviously there will be problem but uh, how much of data is missing that is more important so upper air data what is the, what does the question mean does it mean that in india does it mean that in india the upper air stations are reduced yes, or sir. so many data are not available then probably the answer uh, can be given in different way but one should also think of the other aspect that uh, model itself when the analysis is being done and when the forecast are being done 
I will put it in a different way. For example, dynamical downscaling. Let us think of the dynamical downscaling. Dynamical downscaling, when you are going from, let us say, 100 kilometers to uh, 30 kilometers, we, are, we have the original data at 100 kilometers from the global model. We are going to 30 kilometers. So we are generating so many data in between from 100 kilometers when you come to 30 kilometers, we are generating. But these data are not generated at random. It is not simple interpolation because the model has its own physics. So all these data are coming through the physics. They are generated at the data void points. That means uh, in between two points, there are five or six points more where data was not there. Now we are getting those data through the model. That means it are coming through the physical processes. These data follow the physical laws and then only they we have not interpolated simply, simple interpolation. So the missing data, certain missing data can also be uh, incorporated through the physical processes in the uh, physical parameterization schemes will take care of that. That is also there. You, you understand my point? Can we I... are generating the dynamical downscaling, generating some data, which where there is no data earlier. How those data are generated? Those are generated through solving the equations. So physical processes are being followed. So it is not simple interpolation between two points, but it is the uh, data which are humidity, temperature, etc. Those are obtained through the physical parameter schemes following certain physical laws. So those data have some quality. The data generated through the models have also some quality, which may not be exactly like reanalysis, for example. Reanalyzed data are nowadays taken as the observed data, but they are not real observation. There will be some difference. But those data have high quality data, which are generated through mathematical modeling. Similarly, if few days of data are not there in the upper atmosphere, it depends how many, I don't know, it will affect, but whether it will affect significantly the accuracy or not, that has to be tested. Because the uh, ECMWA model, they are not utilizing our data. Because they sometimes say that these are not of good quality. Upper air level, upper air data. Still, their prediction is uh, having some quality, isn't it? <clears throat> I'd like to My answer will be it will affect, but how much, how much quantitatively is to be exactly studied? Then it will be known. There is another question: uh, How GCM models yeah. can be used in climate change impact studies? With the first GCM model. Yeah. GCM. GCM models can be used in climate. Oh, GCM is model. GCM is global. GCM global, global, global climate models, model. Yeah. That that cannot be directly the present level of GC. As I showed, there are different types. So unless you have R system model, unless you have the R system model, gen any general GCM if you talk of may not give the right uh, climate parameters. You have to have R system model where all the significant processes are incorporated. So if you talk of a particular GCM, maybe one can try to answer. But in general, GCM means, I will assume that our system processes, all processes are not incorporated because initially GCM started only for atmosphere and there is no ocean model, there is no sea ice interaction, there is no bio processes, etc. incorporated. That way, I would say that only the same is not the right thing. But uh, our system models, whatever they are projecting for the future, uh, with proper data input, uh, some models are giving very good results, at least for India, five to six models were identified. And uh, all other models are not that good. So the question is uh, how GCM can? Can be used to. Ah, it can, it has to be used. It is being used. It, but, uh, same, uh, our system models are being used profusely for the climate uh, scenario generation. Yeah, but climate change impact studies they have some separate models, I guess. No, Not no impact impact doesn't come from the model. Exactly, exactly. Like I showed the colleagues, 
Yes. Connex is for impact studies. So yes. Connex is dynamical downscale. Uh, that means the global input, uh, global model in output is going to the as boundary condition to the regional model. And regional model is set on that is dynamical downscaling. So from uh, coarser resolution, you come to let us say 12 kilometer as I showed there in the uh, Copernicus data. 12 kilometer data are utilized. Those data are used into crop model, for example. Those data are used in the impact studies of the water availability through hydrological models. So there will be hydrological model to interact with this. So from the atmospheric model data, you take the products like temperature, rainfall, uh, humidity, wind, all this uh, output data from the uh, dynamical downscale model are taken into the crop model or into the hydrostatical model or into the vector model, for example, malaria studies, human health, that's called vector model. All these parameters are feed into this. Uh, so there is interaction between the uh, hydrological model and the atmospheric model. There is interaction between the crop model and the hydrostatic uh, uh, global model or the correct, correct output. That way, it, so impact studies are always done by taking the parameters from the, like air pollution also, in case of the air pollution also, or the uh, separate modules can be there. These are called modules, like uh, air pollution modules are there, which are interacting along with the regional climate model. Regional climate model has a separate module for air pollution, where there is interaction between the air pollutants and the dynamics of the atmosphere. This is how impact studies are done. But impact studies are not per se, they are not part of the uh, our system model. They are separate models or modules. That is how impacts are being done through modeling. Someshwar, sir, you have any? Um, well, I just wanted to address or supplement uh, the answer. I don't know whether the person who asked the question about the impact of the upper air data in the model, whether he is still present or not, I don't know. But I would like to supplement that, uh, yes, on yeah, yeah. real time weather forecasting, no, every observation is very important. Uh, and the papers you know, written by people from the ECM, WF and other places also, we can give you the exact reference and you know, I share your email. Now, how much is the impact of which type of data? Like, what is the impact of satellite data? What is the impact of upper air radiosome data and so on? And people have found that, of course, the highest impact is from the satellite data for weather forecasting, especially followed by the upper air data, right? So th these observations are certainly very, very important in the real-time forecasting. And with regard to the past data, of course, they're important for the real analysis. And when the real analysis is carried out, then those observations which were not uh, available in the real time for weather forecasting, they are utilized for the producing the real analysis. So that way, all data are important, right? Uh, but uh, I mean, the accuracy of the forecast certainly depends on the observations. And Professor Das has uh, rightly pointed out that uh, when the data is not available, then the model is capable enough to reproduce the the data at the data void reason, like you know. Earlier days, you know, 10, 20 years ago, or even before that, when satellites were not so many and so much, then especially about the ocean region and in the southern hemisphere, basically it was just reproduced by the model itself. But now, because of the availability of the satellites, you know, many data void regions are now filled up, and so we have got better you know, analysis, reanalysis uh, products of, for the atmosphere. So that is what I thought to supplement. So there is another question. Could you please suggest the research opportunities after PhD apart from IMD? <laughs> Sorry, can you repeat the question? Then I will answer properly. Uh, could you please suggest the research opportunities after PhD apart from IMD? I don't know that. IMD is not. There is, if you directly think of, then there is NCMWF, there is uh, IATM. There are universities, there are IIT, there are NITs. Uh, uh, so there are many organizations like that. Uh, ISRO, uh, CSIR labs, uh, there are many organizations like Central University nowadays coming up. 
But question is that, uh, you, as I explained and showed that it is a much broader than only research and educational. People should think of going in a different way, including startup. Then only the science will grow and then only the society will be benefited. If you look for only research and teaching jobs in uh, IMD or IITM, that is not adequate and the society may not gain much also. Like in the energy sector, those who have engineering background, they can <coughs> go into the energy sector. <coughs> I will answer to the person who asked this question that I just before coming to this lecture, I searched the Google, Google search job opportunities in climate. So many sites are there, so many companies are there. I didn't put India alone, I put just broad. Almost uh, all developed countries have so many jobs outside the government sector, let us say. If you say I am in the government sector, government sector jobs are not adequate uh, for all of us because we know that. And uh, we may be more satisfied in those organizations because we have not tested the water, so we don't know how testful it is. <laughs> we have to test it. And uh, so many sites you can't imagine. Then I go, Google search the jobs in India. There are also about 10 or 12 pages with uh, different companies. Different companies are there. I can't pronounce these names of those companies. So one has to try that. If you think that Sky may be the only organization, one or two which you know, then you are not doing justice. This is a versatile subject where the core sector is research, definitely, research and education. But beyond that, there is much more. If I will draw his attention to one of the slides I showed, right hand side there was modeling and two or three sectors, ocean modeling, physical processes, two or three sectors. On the left hand side, there are so many sectors, agriculture, human health, environment, and one should realize that environment and climate, they are not really so separate. Climate and environment are together. Many people don't understand, many companies don't understand what is the climate issue and what is the environment issue. If you look very closely, there are differences. But you cannot demarcate, you cannot put a line that this is environment, this is climate. So if you have a degree in climate science or our system science as it happens in many universities, you can also look for those. And once you, once you enter into that, you have to find out your own way how to grow. But that is related. At least you know something. And many people are joining there without knowing anything about uh, the weather and climate or climate change. So one has to think of the climate, if you look for the job as such, look in a broader sense, climate change. Climate change means sky the limit. Where you will fit, you have to accordingly see what is the profile, job profile, and what topics you have learned to fit into that system. That you have to decide, it's your personal decision. But you cannot think of only IMD, only IITM, only IIT, or only Central University. That is why in our applications for one post, there are 200 applicants. Because we are not going beyond this, uh, think of the climate change, including the, your own startups, for the youngsters I'm telling. And the company jobs uh, will also be with very, hydrology, for example. Hydrological modeling and hydrological studies, they are in great demand. There are many, many people who want to know what is the runoff, how much is coming, how much ice is melting. Many companies have come up for that type of studies. Irrigation purpose, uh, insurance sector is coming. In insurance sectors also, they want experts with our knowledge. Energy sector, they want experts with our knowledge. Legal issues, there are books on uh, climate change and uh, law, uh, law, law, law making or something like that. Inequality is a big issue. So they are being discussing how the uh, um, poor people are obviously more affected than the well-to-do persons because of the climate change. So how the rules should be 
favorable to them, this type of things. So there are enough issues. We should not be narrow and we should not be limited to only the core climate issue. Then, of course, we are in trouble. And there are not enough jobs because, yeah. Uh, I would like to add, uh, yeah, I would like to add something more, especially for those who are from India. I mean, because while I was in service, uh, I know that in IMD as well as in, in NCMRWF, now, when we used to have the project uh, positions vacant, then the candidates which we desired to have, we were not able to get it. I mean, there were so many applicants from so many fields, but yeah. not the one which we desired, like from the atmospheric science. No, we were not able to get it. So there is plenty of scope for people having degree in atmospheric science. Uh, even now in the government sector, you know, either through the project or even definitely in the academic Universities, academic institutions also. I know that in Central University of Rajasthan, where I was working earlier, there were two big projects and uh, there are plenty of you know, GRF positions, but we are not able to get there. People are not able to apply there. Or even those people who are applying, they are really not, uh, not desirable <laughs> there. So, but I will say, I, I will say that uh, the, the academics are also have some problem in the sense uh, you see, there are, uh, in many institutions nowadays, there are employment sales and they invite the companies to give presentation to the students before the campus, uh, what is called campus placing, campus placing for That's that. They invite. Sale, yeah. So it is our role. It is our role to, I tried in IIT Delhi, it was very successful to invite the companies to give some sort of seminars. Because students, who is student who is working on monsoon, he really doesn't know what are the other company, what are the uh, employment opportunities. So if you invite the hydrologists, companies who are dealing with hydrological studies or human health, how the rainfall is uh, affecting the malaria, there is a pattern. There is a pattern of rainfall, heavy rainfall, and malaria. All these things once. Uh, the companies come and say that we need this type of background. If you have experience in rainfall, monsoon rainfall, we also need you because you have understood the monsoon rainfall, which will help us to eradicate malaria or plan for malaria activities, etc. So human health point also, that is a requirement. And it is our duty to bring uh, these such companies and ask them for seminars to give seminar to the students. So it has to be a joint effort. And we cannot simply tell that they are looking for this job. How many of us are really inviting these uh, new companies to come to our campus and give seminars? That is employment opportunities. Don't you think that that will help these students? And now we're demanding, some of us are demanding course on undergraduate level. Think of what disaster it will lead to. If you have a course, regular course with 100 marks or 200 marks in undergraduate studies, again, the only problem, our MTech students are in, from IIT. Hardly uh, some MTech students go for uh, what you call the research oriented. Probably 5 to 6% probably come to research. Others look for other jobs because campus recruitment is being made. Companies come and they give presentations. Sometimes people find that it is interesting to join those companies, whatever knowledge you have. You cannot say that I will work only on company in the monsoon. No, that is not, you have to go for applied side. So that we have to introduce in the curriculum itself that companies should come and talk about their activities. Then only it will help the uh, our students to get jobs uh, outside the academic institutes and government sector. We have a role to play. Yeah, most of the academic institutions now, they have the placement sale through which uh, these private companies uh, do come and then uh, select yeah. the students uh, there. Yeah, that is about the India, but I don't know about the other countries because here the people are from 30 countries. I don't know how many people from which countries are attending this you know, lecture. But for other countries also, I'm sure similar kind of opportunities may be there. And I know that many students, our own students want to go abroad. Even after graduating from our institutes, you know, despite 
the fact that there are plenty of job opportunities in india also people prefer to go abroad so that means uh, definitely there are a lot of opportunities also outside india so that way certainly it will be helpful i showed two slides on that us bureau, bureau example like yeah. that 8% growth in right. coming decade and also in india also there's a feeling that the green energy sector will uh, expect more people with background of uh, atmospheric science forget about meteorology as such meteorology is not the only topic which you are bringing under atmospheric uh, weather and climate i would like to call it weather and climate science where many things come up together weather and climate science there will be applications also so everything comes under that problem and uh, job market is not that bleak but we are not knowledgeable about those that is why there is a problem and there should be some some uh, awareness programs about the job uh, recruitment etc probably some society sama sama can take up but somebody has to prepare well uh, to bring all these companies uh, documents and uh, show to the audience that is students that these are the different sectors where you can go for i know agriculture sector i know hydrology sector i know human health uh, and uh, at least uh, clean energy clean energy sector also can take care of that and specific topic wise i don't know that has to be okay yeah. i i think um, thank you professor dash for raising this very important uh, issue of a broad based Uh, employment uh, opportunities in the climate uh, application climate change applications and you are rightly said that we need to explore beyond the government sector which which has got we uh, see not unlimited scope to to absorb these uh, uh, young people uh, we'll positively think the sama will think we'll work with the ams um, uh, indian med society and ifms to work out a brainstorming session on this particular topic and uh, with your help we may like to have the experts from different sectors to tell the uh, young students and researchers that these are the opportunities which uh, happens to be and how they can orient their you see knowledge or uh, expertise uh, in those sectors so this is a positively i, I think way forward uh, of this particular uh, uh, talk, your talk that yes um, after this introductory talk we need to take a next step as far as the application of this weather and climate science for job opportunities uh, part is required thank you so this these are my comments i said before other questions okay. come up um, you have very rightly brought out the, these opportunities yeah, I, thank I, you i i just wanted to uh, add my concern just yesterday i read one article in the bulletin of the american ecological society uh, about the number of students uh, taking admission in the atmospheric science at the degree level and uh, the statistics shown there for the last 5 years uh, from 2015 to about 2019 showed that uh, i mean is matter of concern that the number of students you know preferring to study atmospheric science has slightly decreased uh, which is a matter of concern and we have if it is happening also in india and our you know neighborhood country then it is matter of concern that why the students are not preferring to study atmospheric science is that because they do not know the scope the career opportunities or something else so <laughs> i just thought to uh, say about this one sir in atmospheric science immediate after post graduation uh, very uh, difficult to get a job opportunities unless if a student uh, do the phd so that is the main reason of uh, students are not coming for the uh, post graduation and the graduation studies but i had one direct experience in oceanography course when i was in germany lot of people joined and then they left because they are surfer so they thought if they understood that if they learn oceanography they may good surfing well but lot of mathematical equation actually distracted them so they left so lot of time people think atmospheric science and oceanic science are comparatively easy one but when they see lot of mathematics even in our institute also lot of people join in first semester they change in the second semester 
ओके थैंक यू स्वागत है वी कैन वी कैन क्लोज या या आई थिंक सो स्वागत है ओके आई कैन आस्क वन लास्ट क्वेश्चन बिकॉज़ दिस इज इंपोर्टेंट वन आई थिंक सो सो वी ऑल थिंक अबाउट द ग्रीड रिजोल्यूशन इज इंपोर्टेंट बट व्हाट वुड बी द आइडियल ग्रीड रिजोल्यूशन वी वांट टू रीच टू हु आज ही डिड यू पुट इट इन नेम what is the grid resolution used for climate impact studies what would be the ideal resolution we want to reach to because it is 12 km 4 km 1 km so no it depends on the application and area for example plain area resolution it will be different from the uh, mountainous regions isn't it so if you uh, think of a dynamical downscaling over the himalayas i think it should be much more the resolution has to be even kilometer range because their slopes are there sun uh, on the same mountain one side there will be sunshine and there will be darkness there will be no sunshine so radiation will be different uh, rainfall will be completely different which is falling at the uh, top and below so there is no ideal resolution as such it will be as high as possible if you think of the urban area then you may say that few meters isn't it so it depends on the region urban areas if you look at city level you will expect that few meters then only because there are houses there are buildings uh, uh, so few meters over the uh, urban area plain area um, let us say um, to be to be reasonable about 10 it depends on the computing power also maybe 10 kilometers and mountain area maybe 1 kilometer or or less for the present depending on the computing power if you have more computing power you can enhance that resolution and the next thing is that uh, enhancing the resolution always may not give you the right uh, result it depends on so many other factors also so um, application has to be thought of then only you can say that which is the right resolution it depends on uh, application what whether it is agriculture whether it is hydrology if you think of hydrology then what is the runoff that means from the river size will be how much so you need meters is a result uh, river size depends on that if you need to have one kilometer data it may not help you on dam scaling because you want the river stream which is narrow less than that so it all depends on the application best thing is that go down with clusters that means the dynamical and statistical downscaling both together with the use of clusters you can take four or five clusters depending on your convenience how whatever you can take then see the application then decide but global model now they talk of 6 km i don't know whether it has to be tested whether 12 km 6 km results are better than 12 km or not i don't know it has to be tested and again as you know ensemble is coming up so ensemble will also helps in uh, what you call uh, checking the resolution part deficiency because of resolution that also can be because uh, multi model ensembles are the best uh, forecast as far as i understand that is what i learned from other podcasters that uh, multi model ensemble is the best forecast possible so far so whatever lacuna is there in one model other model they take care of each other and that is the best forecast it is even better than increasing the resolution that i will think of you have to think about the signal again whether the signal forecast or daily forecast so many questions are coming it has to be tested but i think ensemble if you have a choice of ensemble and resolution first probably you should go for ensemble at the same resolution isn't it then go for enhanced resolution so first yes. try 12 km ensemble then try 6 km ensemble and you can compare because some people say that cmip 6 results are not great compared to cmip 5 Many people are saying that CMIP six, yeah, so some sir can add CMIP six results are not really that great compared to CMIP five. That is what some people say. We are also experiencing to some extent 
Maybe rainfall has some temperature. Temperature has some advantage. Rainfall, yeah, so much. <laughs> Actually, I was just uh, trying to say something from the point of view of uh, deterministic models. Uh, simply you know, decreasing the size of the grid box or increasing resolution doesn't help much unless you have the observations also compatible to that resolution. Yeah. Actually, if your observation is at 100 kilometer resolution or 50 kilometer resolution, you are trying to run a model at 1 kilometer or 5 kilometer. Because you cannot verify the model. Yeah, exactly. Because you cannot verify the model. So both your observations network as well as the model's resolutions should be compatible. Then only it will give you the meaningful result. By the way, I think today's lecture topic is so important that it will go on and on and endless discussion. Already 5 o'clock, I think uh, Lakshmi Kumar <laughs> must be waiting for us <laughs> to give him a signal to... to uh, yes, sir. Yes, sir. And, uh, yeah, yeah. So, yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, How many people are there? There are some people left or they have... Ah, yes, sir. Yes. 120. Yes, there are 400. So there are around 400, now around 150. Ah, that is, uh, I think, good sign that uh, people are interested to listen. Because after two hours, if 120, more than 120 participants are there, uh, probably Sama is doing a good thing. And uh, this type of discussion should also continue in future, as Dr. Tagi told that uh, opportunities. I'm sure the opportunities part will be very, very interesting if we really show uh, what are the sectors, sector-wise. One has to prepare very well. It is possible to prepare in this age. And it's not difficult, but you need time. What are the different sectors? And uh, what are the different companies, at least the name of the companies, et cetera. Some exposure, some exposure, maybe half an hour talk, or it may not continue for one hour, unless you are some other things uh, before the opportunities, some part of education. That is up to you to plan your core members of SAMA can think of. I, I really enjoyed this. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir, uh, for giving this talk. So now it's time for uh, uh, delivering the vote of thanks. I request uh, Dr. Mohan uh, Kumar Das uh, from Navami, Bangladesh to deliver the vote of thanks. Over to you, Mohan. Uh, thank you. Before vote of thanks, may I request all the delegates to switch on their video for a panelist. panelist yeah. A panelist, panelist. right. Yeah. So for a group photo. Thank you. Uh, just a minute, sir, please. Uh, thank you, Professor uh, Lakshmiji. Thank you. Can you see my slide, please? Yes, 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 we can see you. Okay. Uh, uh, good afternoon, everyone. I believe it is a great honor and privilege for me to present to on behalf of all the participants and Sama, I am glad to be here to express my vote of thanks in this session. First and foremost, I would like to heartfully thank our today's resource persons, Professor Dr. Center of Excellence in Climate Modeling, IIT Delhi, for being here with us and for his excellent delivery. I was listening to your speech with keen interest and I believe all other participants did the same and enjoyed it most. of knowledge, experience, and views with us on <laughs> avenues of education, research, and employment opportunities in weather and climate gave us uh, new ideas for thinking and challenges and would encourage us to work in this sector in future. Our heartful gratitude goes to respected member of the Coordination Committee of SAMA's training course, especially warmest thanks to Air Vice Marshal Retired Professor Dr. Oditya Gisar, President of SAMA, Professor Dr. Somesha Dasar, Secretary General of SAMA, Professor Dr. Deepak Arial, Head CDM of Tribhuvan University, Nepal, Professor Dr. D.B. Bhaskar Rao, 
PDRA at Zeiss University, Dr. T. B. Lakshmi Kumar, SRM IST, and session moderator, Professor Dr. P. V. S. Raju from Amiti University, Jaipur, Dr. Rohini Bhavar, SPPU in India, Dr. Ranjit Kumar Sinha, DEI, Agra, India, Dr. Swagata Paira, BIT Mistra, India, and Treasurer of uh, Sama and Board of Governors and Organizing Committee for arranging such an effective, excellent training program for the research search and early career and professional. I believe this program has become a fruitful and supportive one in changing the knowledge, skills, and attitude of the participants to a better level. Finally, I would like to thank the member of Sama, all other participants from Sama countries and abroad for their spontaneous interaction. Yeah, I think uh, that's the end of the uh, vote of time. So, you know, we are coming to the yeah, yeah, now we are come to the end. One second for being here with us. Yeah, can you can you hear me? Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, I think we have uh, come to the end of the session. I think we can close the session today. Uh, I thank all the we thank all the participants on behalf of Sama and uh, SRMIST for joining today's lecture. So next week uh, we'll be meeting uh, as usual for the on the same time on the twenty eighth at three p.m. IST. Uh, so the talk will be on uh, observations. I mean, it's about the atmospheric instrumentation observations. The talk will be delivered by uh, Dr. Uh, Ratnam, uh, senior I mean, scientist uh, in uh, National Atmospheric Research Laboratory. So I request all the participants to join the talk without uh, fail. So thank you. Thank you for your time. And thank you, thank you all. Thank, thank you. you. We are closing. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, thank you sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Lakshmi. Thank you, sir. Bye. So uh, next is fourth round. And we we'll, uh, can send a request to Professor Desh to send his uh, share his PDF. Uh, he has sent me the presentation, sir. Uh, we have to ask whether we can send it or not uh, to the participants. Yeah. Uh, so because I, today my evening, I think before the lecture, he has before start he sent me. Just yes, stand so, me. so if you get permission, I will convert that into PDF and uh, mm -hmm. send to the participants. Right. Okay. Done. Mm -hmm. And um, th that's great. And uh, keep, keep on, um, you see, periodically updates. See, people have got short memories, so uh, they may attend one lecture, then miss next. <laughs> so we have to keep on, keep on, yes, keep sir, on. Yes, so keep, say, let's be uh, 200 to 300 is a good mark. So we should at least ensure that. Think, uh, today was less than the last time. It was, yeah, it was around uh, 290 today. Today only 290. No, no, wait, wait. So I will stop YouTube first.